Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Horn Call podcast. Uh, my name is James Bolden. I'm the publications editor for the International Horn Society and your host. We have a really special guest today, uh, one who is actually uh, a first among our podcast guests. Um, Dr. Catherine Lakuta is actually not a horn player, but uh, as you'll hear in the the podcast coming up uh she is much deserving of of an interview and uh i think you're going to really enjoy listening to her energy and enthusiasm and just all of the wonderful amazing stories she has about writing for the horn if you don't know her music be sure to uh, either stop the tape right or <laughs> the tape. That's d- d- certainly dating myself. Uh, be sure to stop the recording at this point and go check out her website and listen to some of the clips of her amazing music. And once you've done that, and uh, after that, I'm sure you'll be energized to find out more about her and her uh, compositional style and her approach and all of the many, many accolades and collaborations she's had with some uh, fantastic horn players out there. Uh, This is a really great conversation, and I don't want to take too much away from it, but I just want to wish everyone well as we are uh, into the second episode of our second season. I want to thank all of the uh, listeners and people who've sent me uh, nice notes about the podcast. I hope that it's it's reaching folks out there, and I hope that you are finding uh, something um, inspiring in what our guests have to say. I know I always do. I have uh, some, uh, you know, sometimes they're deep conversations, sometimes they are uh, <laughs> somewhat frivolous, and I think you'll find um, uh, that my conversation today with Kathy Lakuta is is full of all of those and more. Uh, if you've not had a chance yet to check out the many offerings of IHS 53, uh, those will be archived until November 22nd, is, uh, if, uh, if, if I memory serves uh, me correctly on that. So if you've not done so yet, be sure to check those out. Be sure to get in your orders for the 50th anniversary commemorative book if you haven't done that yet. So here we go with my conversation with Kathy Lakuta. As I was saying earlier, most people in the horn world probably know your name. If for nothing else, uh, you're one of the most recent winners of the International Horn Society's Composition Contest. uh, uh, I threw a shoe at a cat, which is, I think that should win a prize just for the the coolest name of a a horn piece. But it is a really amazing piece of music, right? Uh, Oh, thank you. That you wrote for uh, Peter Luff, right? You're uh, yep. a collaborator of yours. And you've had lots of great collaborations with uh, some really fantastic horn play- players. And I want to make sure and, and get to that. Um, but I just want to thank you again for, for speaking with me today. And I think maybe my first question, if you want to talk a little bit about it, might be to maybe in, in, a, in a fairly condensed way, kind of explain how you ended up in Australia, where you are now doing what you're doing in as, you know, as many or as few words as you'd like, you don't necessarily have to tell us your life story, but, um, you know, I, I think our listeners for sure would probably want to know just a little bit about your background and how you ended up, uh, doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thanks, James. Thank you for having me. First of all, oh, I've listened to numerous, uh, um, podcasts, uh, uh, from your series and, uh, I love, horn in case people haven't noticed i love writing for horn and i love corn people corn community you're all awesome and so it's my absolute pleasure uh to be here and to be chatting with you um yeah so uh, how i got to australia um so i was born in ukraine in kiev which is the capital of ukraine uh in a family of musicians on both sides and uh but i'm the first composer so i had choral conductors and pianists and saxophonists and uh percussionists um and almost everyone in my family was a musician and uh i started um my um, musical education in ukraine and uh then we moved to the us with my husband in 2005 uh, he was doing a grad school at Cornell and then postdoc at the University of Chicago. So we lived 
in Ithaca, New York for four years and then in Chicago for three years. And after that, he got a job at the University of Queensland. And so we moved to Australia. Uh, I followed him because you can be a freelance composer, but you cannot be a freelance mathematician. I mean, you can, but it's going to be pretty pathetic. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> I just followed him and uh, decided that wherever I end up with him, I will be able, hopefully, to make my career work there. And so far, it's been working. So we've been in Australia for eight years now. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like I have three homes. Australia is one of them. America, the United States is the other one. And Ukraine is, is yet another one. So um, I love visiting every one of these places. And I love being in every one of these places. Well, that's pretty amazing. And I want to I want to step back in just a second. But that's funny that you mentioned Ithaca, uh, New York. Uh, people in the International Horn Society might remember that there was a, an IHS symposium at Ithaca uh, not that long ago, 2016, I believe it was. Um, and I actually, think so. Yeah, something like that. And uh, that was, I guess, after you had already left Ithaca. And it's funny you mentioned Cornell. Yeah. I, I one of um, uh, a family member of mine, one of my cousins, actually was doing a postdoc at Cornell in food science of all things. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, it's a lovely part of the country. It's really oh, lovely. it's gorgeous. I I literally have it in my dreams. Uh, like when I sleep, I'm dreaming. I quite often I just hike around Ithaca. I just love it. And uh, I think it was either 2016 or 2017, isn't it? Because I, I remember the one in London was in 2015, I think. And then mm -hmm. there was one in LA after that, I believe. And then it took, isn't it pathetic that I remember all of these things, even though I haven't been to them? Anyway, um, I, it's not, I'm a groupie, I'm a horn groupie, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, but I've heard that it was amazing in Ithaca, and uh, of, of course it was. Alexander Schuchen was organizing it. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, shout yeah. out to Alex. <laughs> yeah, he's he's fantastic. And that was, oh. you know, it, it is interesting, these IHS symposia, and I, I'm sure it's the same with other instrumental societies. Each one has kind of a different feel, you know. They all have different, you know, obviously different locations and different hosts and you know we all come together for uh, you know that one reason to because we love the horn and, and horn playing but you know each each venue and each uh symposium has kind of a different a different uh atmosphere so yeah i, I remember specific ones for different reasons myself um yeah <laughs> I, so you you got pretty much most of your musical training in in the ukraine and then you moved yep. to the united states was that a big shift moving from uh ukraine to the united states and then going from the united states to australia if if in terms of you know cultural life uh, and music and the arts and that sort of thing it was it was a very big shift uh, in um in a variety of ways so yeah um just to um finish up on my education yes uh, so i obtained very thorough musical education and musical and otherwise education in ukraine which was by the way all free of charge so i did five years seven years of music school five years of an undergrad in jazz and classical piano and then a five-year higher degree in composition and all of that was free. Um, and then I went to the US and there I studied for three and a half years uh, individually with Dana Wilson and for mm -hmm. three years with Steve Stuckey, both free of charge because they are just amazing humans. And I was in town and they didn't want me to get to be left behind. Uh, so I owe everything to them. Um, and then I started freelancing and then, then I got my PhD here in Australia when I came here. Um, so culturally, yeah, I mean, when I came to the US, everything was different, right? I had to start speaking a different language as my primary language. And I didn't even talk to anyone. I didn't know anyone for the first six months. So that was quite a challenge. So my husband and I decided that um, following on a suggestion from a family friend that he and I would speak English during the day and then Ukrainian in the evening so that I would practice because I remember turning on the news and just thinking Jesus just slow down because <laughs> like I know all these words but I cannot this is too fast this is way too fast you know and uh so my my uh, I thought my English was quite good the grammar and everything but the speed 
and uh, the fluency uh, of the real life English, you know, when you have to deal with that, that was way too much. So my husband and I started speaking English with each other. And uh, he remembers that the first couple of months or so, I would be really quiet during the day. And then when we would switch to Ukrainian, I would just explode and start telling him everything. And so he figured me out and he was like, you know, this is not how it's going to work. So we were working on that. And then I started talking to Dana Wilson. And Dana also remembers how the first couple of months I uh, wouldn't say anything. And he thought she's just such a shy girl and like he, that he needed to help me open up. Mm. No, that was, that was <laughs> a lie. I was just, <laughs> I was just scared that I would say the wrong thing, you know? And now it's so different for me. I, I now cannot really speak about my work in Ukrainian anymore. I need to, I'm so used to my work. I'm so used to working with English speaking musicians and all the English terminology that it's just, I don't even know how to explain a lot of things about my work to my Ukrainian colleagues. Oh, so that's it's quite interesting. An, yeah. Yeah, it's quite an interesting shift. And uh, I do think in English now more than, than I think in Ukrainian, though I use Ukrainian still every day with my parents and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, uh, life in Ithaca was very different from life in Kiev because Kiev is uh, a capital of Ukraine, over 3 million people, a very, uh, you know, cosmopolitan city, very, like, very kind of, uh, very much a party town right now, um, kind of a fancy city, really fun. You can travel anywhere by, uh, by public transport. You can come out pretty much anywhere in the street, you'll be able to buy ice cream and whatnot. In Ithaca, you have to walk like 40 minutes to get to any kind of <laughs> sort of life and civilization and no public transport really and, and all that. So that was a massive shift for me from the 25 first years of my life. Um, and then we moved to Chicago. So that was oh, a little bit like being back in Kiev. Um, and the move to Australia was um up, i think it was much smoother than the move from ukraine to the united states uh i was worried that i would have to start over again because the hardest part about moving to the us was making myself a name mm. and because you know i would come and i would tell people i studied with this person and this person and they are the absolute stars in ukraine but nobody knows them in the united states or in Australia. So that meant nothing to people. So I had to prove myself again and again, you know, I made a name for myself in Ukraine and then I had to throw it out and come to the US and start over. And so I was worried that the same would happen in Australia and to an extent it did, but the it was much easier. And uh, I was really lucky with Peter Lapp when I contacted him and I told him, look, I worked with Adam Answorth before coming here. Um, and he knew Adam Answorth from the International Horn Symposium that mm -hmm. took play, place in Denver. He saw Adam performing. And so when I mentioned my work with Adam, Peter immediately thought, okay, I need to check out what she's doing because she must be the real deal, et cetera. And uh, so, you know, Peter being absolutely amazing, the champion of new music and, uh, you know, looking out for talent and supporting it. And he saw potential in me and he um, supported me straight away. And uh, it, so that was, I was not coming from somewhere where people didn't know anyone with whom I worked, you know, that really helped that connection. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> no, no, this is, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think uh, this would be kind of a cool angle to take from this. So I guess in my mind, I knew that you had worked with both Adam Unsworth and Peter Luff. Um, so how did you connect with Adam in Chicago before he because he was in uh, Detroit and then the Philadelphia Orchestra and then at the University of Michigan now. So how did how did that connection happen, that network? Yeah, it was uh, it, it it was really really cool. It was a fateful connection, I would say. Um, so there there are no short Likuda stories. So if I'm saying telling a story and it's too long, please let me know, and I'll try <laughs> to condense them as much as I can. But uh, 
um, it's kind of interesting, I think, to see where things came from. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was living in Chicago, yes, and uh, um, I was visiting University of Michigan. And back then I, I was at that stage of my career where if I, well, I guess I could still do it now, uh, maybe, but that was much more common for me at that time. Um, when I would be visiting a new school, I would look up people who work there and I would write, for example, if I have a piece for piano, I would write to a piano professor and say, um, maybe we could meet for lunch uh, or maybe I could send you my music just so that you are aware of my work, you know, not soliciting or anything, but just um, kind of spreading the word. And uh, so I wrote to their, uh, I think their saxophone professor their, or, or their clarinet professor, their piano professor and, and someone else. And um, I didn't have any music for horn at that time, and it was 2010. Um, and their piano professor wrote back to me saying that he's not going to be in town, but uh, he listened to my little three-minute rondo for piano solo on my website, and he thinks that Adam Answorth, their horn professor, will be in love with my music. Oh. And I should write to him. And I should make sure that instead of meeting with him, the piano professor, I meet with Adam Answorth while I'm there. And I thought, well, yeah, thanks, but that's going to be one awkward email, you know? <laughs> uh, like this guy next door to you said that you would love my music, so let's meet, you know? And I didn't have any music for horn at that point. So I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, but that guy, instead of just writing to me, he also knocked on Adam's door and said, she will be visiting and here's the piece, listen to it. So Adam emailed me, uh, maybe like um, I, I was supposed to leave on Tuesday morning and he emailed me Monday evening and said, my piano, uh, my, my piano colleague said that you are going to be visiting and I listened to your ronda, I really like your style, maybe we could meet up for lunch. Um, so... I was like, oh my God, yeah, okay, let's do that. So we met for lunch and we chatted about music and I um, burned, <laughs> we were burning CDs at that time. Mm -hmm. um, that that was already so cool, but it sounds so dinosaur right now. <laughs> so anyway, we, <laughs> I burned a CD before leaving home for Adam with some of my music, some more jazzy inspired stuff, um, because we both have background in jazz and classical music. Um, and we had a common friend in Dana Wilson, and so Dana wrote a lot for Gail Williams and Gail was Adam's teacher mm -hmm. and Dana was my teacher. So we made that connection as well. And uh, so we had that lunch and I gave Adam that CD and uh, I went back to Chicago and he emailed me maybe a day or two later and said, uh, okay, so I listened to your music. Um, I want to commission a piece from you for you and me to play together. So that was a requirement that I play the piano on that piece uh, because he could, uh, he saw that our styles of performance clicked. <clears throat> my, my jazz and classical background kind of, uh, uh, you know, echoing or, or however you would like to put it, his mm -hmm. jazz and classical background. And uh, so, yeah, so I wrote my first, so I asked him to add a violin because I already had an idea for, um, out of the woods, which is horn, violin, and piano, my first um, horn trio and my first piece for horn. And he said, okay, so I did that. And that's how it all uh, started, how my collaboration with Adam started. And so I would take, um, we were in Chicago for two more years before, or like a year and a half before we went to Australia. So I took a few trips to Ann Arbor, where Adam was, which is a four hour drive or so. Um, so we premiered, we actually premiered Out of the Woods at Cornell uh, together and we played a recital of music for horn and piano and we featured the premiere of Out of the Woods on it. And then Adam asked me to write another piece, which would be a CD opener for a CD on which Out of the Woods would also go. And uh, so I wrote snapshots and uh, we recorded the CD was the same name. Um, and then I went to Australia and 
at that time, Adam was pretty pissed that I was going to Australia. <laughs> but I told him, well, I'm sorry, America couldn't make us an offer that we would like and Australia could. But uh, then we had Adam over here uh, just a year or so after I moved. So Peter Laugh and I hosted him. Uh, and uh, that was awesome. He was pretty happy at that time that, that I <laughs> went to Australia. And now we play recitals at different places uh, every, we, we do these mini tours every two years or so. Um, so, cause I come over to the US uh, on a regular basis for work. And uh, we're hoping that uh, Adam comes back here soon as well. <laughs> that's fantastic. And I think that's, that hits on one of the things, especially in kind of our world of music is that it, it's such a small place. I mean, you know, the, this connection from the Ukraine to the United States and then stretching all the way to Australia, it's, it's, it's a long distance geographically, but making these connections is, is so important, especially for people starting out. And then, you know, you, you, you meet people, as you said, kind of just by chance sometimes, and it becomes such a, fulfilling collaboration one that you know can last uh, an entire career and i think um you know one of the one of the things i wanted to be sure to ask you about in our conversation today was advice that you might have for uh composers just starting out and i think that that's such an excellent intro to that is to you know just don't be afraid to put yourself out there to just kind of email someone out of the blue and just say hey i'm i'm here i'm doing this and this is my stuff absolutely yeah uh it's um I mean, it really depends on uh, what you're doing. You have to be ready for it. Oh, I have a lot of advice for young composers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, quite often, young composers would talk to me when I would do some substitute teaching or something else. And quite often, I think, oh, no, don't do that. You know, and that's how advice kind of oh, come, um, comes to me. But, uh, but definitely, I mean, I think... This is always, you know, for a composer to put themselves out there. Uh, it's important. It's also, it's so kind of controversial. It doesn't have to be, but it, it, it's very subjective. So some people will think that what I'm doing, for example, a lot of people think that I'm not putting myself out there enough. A lot of people probably think that I am putting myself out there too much. And, uh, you, you know, and you don't know where the truth is, but uh, especially my band conducting friends, because when, when I'm not writing for horn, quite often I'm writing for band. And so my band conducting friends quite often tell me that I'm not, look, I need to email band directors and tell them about my music and I need to kind of promote it this way. To me, it feels really awkward at this stage of my career but they say that this is how it's done so it's uh, there is a very thin line between making people aware of your music and soliciting in mm. my in my mind so and and i think caring about that line um the degree to which you should care about crossing that line uh it increases as you get older and you get more deeper into the professional career because you have a name and you have a reputation. You know, when you're a student, you you have to try lots of things and uh, people will be very patient with you because they know that <clears throat> you're young. So definitely trying out. I mean, it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt. And I got several really amazing collaborations this way when, when I, uh, was visiting the US. And I actually learned this from my husband, who who is a mathematician. Um, he was visiting schools with seminars and he would write to people and say, look, I'll be in the area. And frankly, I live in Ithaca and I'm visiting California. You know, it's like halfway across the country, no, no, literally on the opposite side of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm from Ukraine, like the chances that you've ever met me or meet me again, will meet me again are pretty slim. So maybe we could catch up for coffee and have a chat, you know, and uh, people usually respond pretty well to that. And uh, so I learned that from him. And uh, um, yeah, I, I uh, one of the people I wrote to <clears throat> this way, 
um, from Louisiana State University ended up, he's a senior saxophone player, uh, was much senior to me. And he really enjoyed my piece for saxophone and piano. And then I made a concerto version of it later on for someone else. And he's um, playing it and he's uh, um, spreading the word about my music. He's been spreading the word for the past like 12 years or something like that. And turned out he was actually the president of the North American Saxophone Alliance. And I had no idea. I just wrote to him because I was coming to LSU, you know. So definitely, uh, you never know. Uh, definitely should try to spread the word about your music in a sensible way. But uh, also, you know, that the starting point for me is really just write the music that you believe in, that you want to spread the word about and then the rest can be managed but that first part to me is the most important one no that's that's fantastic advice i was gonna ask you at, at listening to your horn writing it, it you know you, you really i think there's a, a love for the instrument that comes through and that doesn't mean that your music is easy some of it is, is it sounds quite difficult um but it, it, it always sounds like it's it's written for the horn, if, if you take my meaning. It, it, it works really well on the instrument, very idiomatic. What do you what do you what is it about the horn that you that you like so much as a composer and that that inspires you to write music for it? Yeah, well, thank you for the kind words about my writing. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> I'll start with a short story um, because I, I don't know, to me, it's funny. Um, I remember, so last in-person IHS symposium, which took place in Ghent, in Belgium, mm -hmm. and uh, I had performances of six of my works there, which I was really grateful for and excited about. So I was there um, playing in, uh, the piano in all these performances. And so I remember very vividly um, during the European premiere, I think, of... Um, uh, out of the woods this um, trio and playing with the violinist was a local violinist from Ghent and uh, a principal horn of uh, Antwerp Symphony uh, and uh, we are on stage and this is the piece that like you snooze you lose it's 14 minutes of just non-stop uh, counting and just being in the zone you need to follow it like every second you know mm -hmm. um and i remember i'm playing and the piano part is really um involved as well but i played it so many times that you know it's just kind of the extension of me um but i remember playing and looking at elise the horn player and looking at svenja the violinist and just thinking you know and svenja is going all the way all the violin it, you know how violin is very it can be very show off mm -hmm. in terms of uh all the um uh, gesturing and uh, you know just the the body movements uh sure. right it's like you yeah. can see that there is virtuosity happening and then so i'm looking at her and this is what i love like i'm a show off kind of person i think on the inside um and this is the kind of music i want to write and I'm looking at Elise and obviously she's playing the, you know, your usual excellent horn playing, very controlled, just kind of the, the movement is happening in the eyes and fingers and that's it. Right. So, mm -hmm. and, and the cue, your cue is breath and not much else. Uh, not much is moving. And I'm just thinking, how the hell did I get myself into writing for horn so much? <laughs> because this is in terms of the, um, the theatrics of it horn is so not what i'm into you know but reflecting on it i don't know i just thought it was so funny that in the midst of that very intense performance i was having these thoughts <laughs> but uh, i don't know what it is i think um well writing it really helped that i got into it through writing for adam because adam told me that i could do anything writing for horn and when he was commissioned uh, out of the woods, my first horn piece, he told me that he was frustrated with a lot of composers he would commission because he specifically asked them to write show off music for him, to write virtuosic, uh, difficult music. 
Mm-hmm. And they were all trying to play it safe mm. because they were thinking about future performances. And rightfully so. But I remember I thought, well, he's the one commissioning the piece. Mm. So either don't agree to accept this commission or say, okay, I will do what you're asking me to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Because obviously you don't want to have one performance of a piece, but you're accepting this commission. You have to accept the conditions that the, the performer is asking you or the commissioning body person is asking you to do so i said yeah i'll write that for you that's not a problem (laughs) and look when i was writing that i had no idea that there was low horn high horn that you could not play this and that and uh that really helped because i could just uh you know i could get into it like like dip my feet into Mm -hmm. the hot water and then (laughs) kind of then get submerged into this whole restraint um of uh, the horn and i remember adam gave me um a bunch of music to listen to so that i could get used to well, what the horn sounds like in contemporary music a mm-hmm. bit more and i remember listening and uh I, I mean i saw from the start that he was a freak in the best possible way he was absolutely amazing but i remember thinking not but and <laughs> i remember thinking that um some really virtuosic music i felt like uh, while i hear that some horn players can play it that's not necessarily what makes horn sound great Mm. and i thought well it sounds like this would just be better off on trumpet and why would you do that why Mm. would you write it for horn and so i remember having these thoughts in the beginning and just thinking yeah um and kind of later on it kind of merged uh, I merged into these thoughts over maybe a year or so or over my first couple of pieces for horn. I remember thinking that these amazing horn players, um, if I'm writing for them and they ask me to write for them, they kind of rely on me treating them well because any composer can make any horn players sound like crap. <laughs> no matter how good... Oh, uh, that's how that's how I feel. No matter how good a horn player is, it's all a lot of it is about what the composer puts into the music. Because if you just write awkward music, it's just not gonna come out sounding nice. Mm-hmm. And so I remember feeling that I have that responsibility to the performers uh, to make them to challenge them, but also to make them sound their best and uh so i remember thinking about that and i keep that um thought with every horn piece that i write but i also remember that you know when i was writing um my oratorio scraps from madman's diary in 2016 and we started rehearsing it and uh the it it was premiered by queensland conservatorium or wind ensemble here and the horn it's the horn studio is uh, of, um, of Peter Love mm-hmm. and uh, so I was working with his undergrad students and one of them came to me and said look we have the hand stopped below like low D like in bass clap and, mm-hmm. and that's that's too low and I was like really so so I asked Peter and Peter said well yeah that would be uh, it's not convenient to do hand stop for students and then I told Adam, and I was like, why didn't you tell me? And he said, because I can do it. <laughs> and and he told me that he could do any of them hand stopped, you know. And then I had a couple of situations like that as well, where people would tell me, you can't really do this with horn. And then I would ask Adam, why didn't you tell me? And he said, because I can do it. You know, so, <laughs> so I had a, a couple of those comical situations. But I again forgot what the question was. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I was just asking about you know your 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 composition process and I, does it? Do you tend to do a lot of? Uh, do you get a lot of feedback from the the musicians you're working with when you're working on a commission, or do you tend to just write it and 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 then deliver it? I always seek um, constructive feedback 
-hmm. I always do and I always ask them, please tell me, I want to know before the premiere so that we have the recording. I don't change anything post the premiere and I don't want to. Um, I usually try to get as much information as possible before I start writing a commission. Mm. And then it's sort of, then I think uh, with the exception of one piece in 2013, then the musicians have always just trusted me and just gave me a green light to do whatever I wanted to do. Because most of the time I would get a commission because somebody liked my music and wanted me with my compositional voice to write for them. So there is already that degree of trust and kind of investment, artistic investment, which mm -hmm. really helps. Uh, with uh, horn, yeah, I just had to... Uh, and look with every instrument I just do very thorough homework mm -hmm. with uh, just studying what this instrument can do can do what's idiomatic what sounds like this instrument where I can challenge it a little bit where I can write something that sounds new and uh, then just go with my instincts and always ask I, I always, well I have a good example from my saxophone writing so i know there is a bit of rivalry so i hope people don't hate me for using saxophone as an example but it's just a very good example i think of um how i do things and i think it's useful this could be useful for other composers maybe um so i was writing a uh, sonata for sax for alto saxophone and piano um commissioned by a duo from sydney conservatorium here and um it was in 2015 or 2016, something like that. And uh, it's called Secrets of Water. I then obviously, because yes, I made a transcription for horn and piano. Um, I actually remember telling um, Adam Answers asked me to make that transcription. I remember coming to Peter Love's office because uh, we were having a chat about something. And I said, oh, by the way, I'm making a transcription of a piece. Uh, I'm making a transcription for horn and piano. He said, yeah. And I said, it's my saxophone sonata. And he said, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was writing the saxophone sonata. And uh, I, um, uh, so it's it's kind of about different natures of water and different personal multiple personalities of water. And there is this one section where it's, kind of uh, like a um, like a water cave with water condensing and dropping down. And it's all supposed to be creepy and like random whale calls and stuff like that. And so I wanted to use multiphonics on saxophone, but I didn't really care which multiphonics on which notes. I, I just wanted the effect. So I wrote to the um, saxophonist from this duo who that commissioned it and I said could you send me a recording and a notation for like four or five of your easiest multiphonics that anyone can play like first year undergrad anyone can play just so that it's easy mm -hmm. and he did and I used them and it just works like magic so I didn't have to and it wasn't just so that it's easier for me I wanted it to be um you know, they know what works better for them. They know what's easier to play. And so I just wanted to use that uh, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a pretty good example. You can do, uh, you can make a parallel with writing for horn as well. You know, I often say, if this note is not convenient, it's not gonna be the end of the world. I would rather I change this phrase or this note than have it squeak in mm -hmm. every performance for every person. And not because it will reflect poorly on me, but because I don't want performers to have to deal with that. So I'm always really flexible <clears throat> with that sort of thing. Um, I personally write the final version of each measure before I move on. So I have a bit of a weird process. I don't recommend it to anyone, but that's what works for me. Mm -hmm. So I don't usually go back and make revisions and revisions and revisions. I usually, when I send it to performers, it's done in terms of form and everything, but I'm happy to make changes, you know, take the mute out, put the mute in, or use stopped instead of, uh, stopped mute instead of hand stopped or stuff like that. Although that doesn't really happen anymore anyway, because I've written so much for horn that it just kind of works most mm -hmm. of the time. 
Um, but yeah, so this is some some of the part, some part of my compositional process. No, that's gr that's great, and thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, uh, speaking about these collaborations with uh, really fantastic horn players, I just listened to your. Um, uh, piece Vivid Dreams, the one you wrote with, uh, for Denise Tryon. Do you want to maybe share a little bit about how that uh, that collaboration got started? Because she's another fantastic performer who just, you know, can pretty much do anything on the instrument, but the, the piece works really well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, she is incredible. I am, I'm really fortunate to be working with people of this caliber and, uh, you, you know, if, if, as a composer, if you get to work with just one person, person like Adam Answorth, or like Denise, or like Andy Pelletier, or like Peter Love and mm -hmm. others, you know, you 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 feel like this is amazing. This is a dream come true. But I got to work with all of them closely, and this is just absolute. I feel like I won a lottery, and you know, you can't put a price on it. Um, so with uh, Denise, it was okay. So. <laughs> There is a little bit of a funny story behind it. So um, <laughs> I uh, saw Denise post something on Horn People or somewhere on Facebook mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. It must have been 2017. Uh, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> hadn't heard the name before. Uh, so I, but I just joined Horn People recently at that time. And so, so I was learning about a lot of new, a lot of, about a lot of horn players who were new to me. They were mm -hmm. obviously not new to the industry, but I was learning about them. Um, and so I uh, read about Denise and I saw that she was doing amazing things. I think she just released her first CD uh, solo. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I thought, this lady looks amazing and I I just want to make her aware of me and my work. I don't want to, you know, imply that she should commission me or that we should work together or anything. I just want to make sure that she knows my name because I feel that I'm a better musician for knowing her name and it would be cool that if she knew my name. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to message to her on Facebook. <clears throat> and I know how most of these messages go. You know, you message and it goes into a limbo somewhere and you never hear from a person again. And uh, so I wrote a message to her. I said that I worked with Adam Onsworth because I knew that she would know Adam because they played mm -hmm. together for, they overlapped for some time in Philadelphia. And uh uh, I sent her the uh, link to my recording of uh, my performance of Snapshots, I think, with Adam. And uh, and it was like midnight, past midnight in Australia. And so I sent that message, closed my computer, went to brush my teeth and get ready for bed. And I'm getting in bed and I hear a message comes on my phone and I check my phone and it's Denise. <laughs> And she says something like, hey, oh, it's nice to hear from you. And she's super friendly and awesome and just warm and charming. Um, and uh, she wrote, oh, this is an awesome piece. Um, can we talk about me commissioning you? And I just was in disbelief. I couldn't believe that it happened. And it happened so quickly. So I, I have no idea what I was trying to write. But I accidentally, like I would never be able to do it on purpose because <laughs> I, I'm not super great with technology. I'm a geriatric millennial. This is the official term. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I'm the one putting geriatric into geriatric millennial. So anyway, I was trying to like to um, type something, but something happened and I accidentally <laughs> sent her an emoji of a fox farting out a love fart. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, no, so I was trying to cancel it, to delete it, and because this is like, this is not who I am as a person, okay, I can be excited, but this is like, um, <laughs> this is next level, and so I wrote to her, so sorry about the emoji, and she was like, ha ha ha, that's okay, and this is how we started collaborating on Vivid Dreams, <laughs> and then she told me that she wanted to uh, she wanted me to write a piece for low horn specifically because there is a big gap in the repertoire for low horn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, 
and we need that repertoire because there are a lot of people who are making money playing for low horn in the orchestras and it's a good idea for them to be able to play something creative and new and fun mm -hmm. and uh so i started analyzing and like pretty much all of my pieces have some low horn playing in them but to write specifically for low horn is a different story um and you know i asked denise okay so what is your range and she said well the entire range of the horn dude <laughs> like mm -hmm. i can play it all it's just a good idea to stick to the <clears throat> lower part for most of it so that it is for low horn and uh so yeah so i started analyzing how to write for low horn and just uh you know thinking about doing less of agile stuff in the bottom part of the range and mm -hmm. less that it speaks a bit slower you know just all these things that articulation is a bit different there um just thinking about everything that could go wrong if i just treat it as my usual writing for horn and uh kind of recalibrating my brain to adjust to that and uh then i learned that denise is obsessed kind of uh in a good way with uh octopus mm -hmm. as a creature and uh i said well somebody must have written you a piece called octopus before right and she said no and i'm like what's wrong with these people <laughs> so i wrote her one one of the movements of vivid dreams is octopus because of that and uh yeah and i wanted it to be kind of dark and a bit surreal because i think low horn is really good with that mm -hmm. and i also wanted it to be i generally like writing programmatic music uh, very much with programmatic titles, but Horn is just such an amazing storyteller that oh, it just, it kind of uh, pushes you towards that in a good way. So, so yeah, Vivid Dreams just came like that. And uh, then I was in Ghent and somehow I decided my brain just never stops. And especially when I'm at these symposia, it's just, it's, it's a curse. Like it's really, <clears throat> I can't sleep because I have 1700 ideas. And one of them was making Vivid Dreams work as a concerto for low horn and wind ensemble. Oh. And so I uh, messaged Denise, she was not in Ghent. Um, she was touring somewhere and uh, I messaged her and I said, well, I have this idea. And she's like, yeah, sure. Okay, let's do it. Let me talk to people and immediately and like two weeks later, we were already signing the contract. And, <laughs> and uh, she premiered that version uh, just before the COVID changed the world in February mm -hmm. 2020 at the CBDNA conference uh, in Oklahoma <clears throat> with the UMKC Wind Ensemble. And <clears throat> Sorry, I believe she's recording uh, the concerto version with um, uh, the the CCM. Oh yeah, the University, University of Cincinnati. School. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're recording it in October, and uh, after that, the piece will be available for anyone to play. It will um, become available for sale. So it will be this new version for horn low horn and uh, wind ensemble and uh, the original version can be pretty much used as a um uh what is it, as a piano reduction so people can use it for practicing and putting it together so yeah pretty excited about all of that denise is uh, she's awesome to work with and to travel with and and uh, just a really really fun human that's wonderful. Uh, and I, I think maybe I ha if you have time for two more questions, I was going to ask you about two more things, if that's if that's OK. I'm all yours. Ask oh, okay. me anything you would like. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you about what what kind of upcoming projects you have. So you, you've done all of these amazing collaborations and you've got you've been incredibly prolific. I'm looking at the list of things you've written for the horn just since, like you said, since 2011, since Out of the Woods. And, you know, you're adding adding new things all the time uh are you are you working on anything that you're particularly excited about or that you want to share oh uh, <clears throat> thank you yeah i'm 
I try to be excited about everything that I'm working on. Uh, it's a little bit less of horn at the moment, uh, but there is still lots of horn. So I, um, um, so I'm writing. Um, I just finished the piece, so adding to some other um, instruments and their catalogs. I just finished a piece for um, a piano and marimba duo. <clears throat> which was pretty exciting and something different to try. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm writing a uh, uh, cello solo piece, which I was thinking that I would probably later rework for horn, but we'll see. Um, this one is, uh, I'll actually mention briefly what it is because it's a really cool commissioning project. So we have Australian National Academy of Music here in Melbourne, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a tertiary institution uh, um, for... Um, basically pre-professional -pre musicians, uh, very high level of performance there. And uh, they have 67 students. And uh, they created this commissioning project where they commissioned 67 composers in one go to oh, wow. each write a six minute piece for each of the students. Isn't that amazing? That is incredible, wow. It's the biggest commissioning project in the history of Australia to date and uh, um, the composers were selected, they selected 15 composers from like the, the uh, most senior established composers in Australia. Mm -hmm. And then the rest was kind of competition based selection. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of those being selected and I'm super excited. And they have a whole bunch of composers ranging from uh, early career to mid career to established. And uh, so I got paired with a cellist and I'm writing a piece for solo cello. <clears throat> My piece is, I think, is going to be called String Quartet Number no. One for Solo Cello. Um, <clears throat> just a um, fun little thing. <laughs> and then I'm uh, writing uh, a uh, piece for a festival uh, for which Peter Laff is the artistic director this year. It's Talgum Festival in um, New South Wales here across the border from us. It's a beautiful venue. It's an annual festival and it's celebrating its 30th year this year. And this is the first year that they will have a composer in residence. And it's me. And oh, uh, congratulations. so, yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So they're going to be playing uh, Schubert Octet, mm -hmm. which was the first piece they played on the very first festival 30 years ago. They're going to be playing it again. Uh, and uh, I'm writing basically for that instrumentation. Okay. So there will be horn in that. Uh, and uh, after that, I'm writing a piece for horn, tuba, and piano. <clears throat> so this is this is writing less for horn. I, this is what I call writing less for horn. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the next piece is for horn, tuba, and piano. It's going to be a CD opener or a CD closer. And uh, it's commissioned by Martin King and okay. uh, Washington State. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, or University of Washington. And uh, so that's the next project. And then um, I'm uh, writing a piece for two saxophones and piano and the band. Oh, and a timpani concerto with band. But I'm also making a transcription of Don Banks' horn concerto. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I think Don Banks wrote it for Barry Tuckwell, if I mm -hmm. remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Um uh, in the previous century, and there is no piano reduction. So I, so Carla Blackwood, who, who is a fantastic player and an awesome person from uh, Melbourne Conservatorium of Music, uh, she's commissioning me to make this transcription. Uh, not well, well a, a um, uh, reduc piano reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, so that people could practice and prepare because it's quite an intricate concerto. Uh, it's quite tricky to put it together with an orchestra. So I'm hoping to put all my knowledge into it and make the preparations easier um, by <clears throat> making a convenient horn part with a lot of cues and uh, that sort of thing. Well, that sounds so like, an, those that sounds like the, an amazing project. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, hopefully it will make the concerto more, um, you know, more people look at it and uh, um, hopefully it will make it more fun to perform. And um, Peter Laugh and I and the whole bunch of other horn players, mostly from the US, were also planning that I would make a transcription 
of my piece Bad Neighbors, which is originally for two for two horn soloists, one low and one high, mm-hmm. and a horn quartet. Then I made a version for two horn soloists and piano accompaniment. We were hoping that I would make a version with either wind ensemble or symphony orchestra, make it a proper kind of double concerto. Oh, cool. And we would tour it across US universities with our friends whom we have a lot of and whom we all love dearly. So um, that was the pre-pandemic plans. Mm -hmm. Um, So we would have probably been doing it right now, if not for the pandemic. So we didn't cancel those plans. We just postponed them. And uh, we're hoping for it to happen very soon. And uh, that would be one exciting project for us. And, you know, it's just also just, I mean, yeah, music, schmuzik, it's also just an amazing excuse to visit a lot of friends and just have fun with them and make music with them and, to, and give them hugs. When the pandemic just started, I just came back from a three-week tour across U.S. And the last person I saw on that tour was the wonderful Nancy Joy mm-hmm. at uh, New Mexico State University, whom I love dearly. And uh, then we, I came back and everything stopped. And uh, I remember now reflecting on it that for a while, there was a feeling that it might never come back. And not like it might never come back in the way that we're used to it being, mm-hmm. but at all Mm -hmm. you know and then i remember like maybe three months into a pandemic somebody bought one of my scores and i thought oh my god this this feels like hope finally because nobody was buying any music nobody was performing anything Mm -hmm. uh so it was quite grim not just from the money perspective but just from the perspective of you know what's happening kind of right um, right so yeah well, um, musicians and- are, if nothing else, we're resourceful, and it was it was inspiring to me to see so many musicians dealing with it, and and uh, you know everybody ha- was dealing with different things um, at at different times, and you know depending on where where in the United States we were and where and what countries, uh, you know. But I think one of the themes was that people started figuring out ways to be creative and to to do what it is that they love regardless of whatever crazy things were going on in the world. And I think to me, that was very inspiring. Yeah. And in an amazing way, you know, I was showing a bunch of stuff to my husband who is, I mean, he's a mathematician, so it's not like they don't do that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All the creativity is in their heads uh, and they're, you know, some party animals. So I was showing him a bunch of stuff that my friends would do. Uh, all these acapella recordings that were coming out and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was just amazed by it. And, you know, um, kind of uh, looking back on that and then jumping a bit ahead, um, with the IHS symposium coming up, obviously it's upsetting that we cannot meet in person in Canada or wherever it would have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yesterday we finished uh, recording, Peter and I finished recording the our recital for IHS. So we have a recital of my chamber music for horn at IHS with Peter on horn and me on piano. Oh, great. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so we're pretty excited about it. But I was also thinking that, you know, of course we would would have wanted to go and see all our dear horn friends and uh, um, see it all in person, hug everyone. But at the same time, because we're doing it online, we can feature more musicians from Brisbane. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we have our friend who plays bassoon playing my little recent two minute piece for bassoon and horn special someone this wouldn't be like she wouldn't have been coming to canada to play two minutes of music and right. uh, here we kind of we can share her with the horn world you know what i mean it's like it's really nice to be able to do this to showcase a little bit of the community um in this way so there are positives um that we have to look for no, that's, while that's awesome yeah. yeah and there there were also quite a few projects that got canceled or postponed indefinitely um that i think they will come back um i'm wearing right now a t-shirt 
from the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. We were talking about a commission for that ensemble just before the pandemic came. Mm -hmm. And obviously that couldn't go ahead, but, and things like that. But I'm sure that it will all happen. And, uh, you know, just seeing how people started applying for grants once the world opened up a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. And like everybody who applied for a grant for a commission from me got those grants approved. And so oh, now great. I'm, yeah, like now I don't have a life. <laughs> but <laughs> I have to compose nonstop, but it's, uh, but it's good that the you know the the very positive signs that the industry is waking up little by little and uh, hopefully there is only there are only better days to come yes likewise I, I i hope for the same and um maybe this is a good place to stop and i just wanted to to mention and if you wanted to add anything to this you're, you're welcome to but for for anyone that doesn't know uh Kathy's music, probably the best way to get it is to go to your website, just to, to Google uh, Catherine Lakuta and your website will pop right up. I've been there many times and there's links to, uh, you know, all of your compositions and recordings and where to buy the music, right? Is, would, would you say that's probably the best way? Yes, absolutely. And uh, there is, um, yeah, all, all the music is available in a PDF format. I uh, always send it very quickly try to send it within one or two business days unless i'm traveling so i'm very responsive i'm very approachable i'm very happy for people to just contact me if they have any questions if they have ideas and it's all i feel very much as part of a horn community and uh, uh a very excited member of the community so i'm always happy to chat and to hear feedback or anything and uh, i will use this opportunity to um express like i have many times how grateful i am for the support of the horn community and for just how awesome you guys are there is no uh on the large scale of things there's no politics there is no fighting there's just making music together supporting each other and uh it's just really my honor and pleasure to be part of this amazing group of musicians worldwide. Thank you, and thanks for speaking with me today. Thanks, James. My pleasure. <laughs>